Greetings and salutations. For today, I thought I might try something just a little different from the usual sort of subject. Rather than seeking out some odd or obscure aspect of the natural world, I intend to look somewhat further afield. Instead of taking a deeper look into reality, let us pay a brief visit to somewhere more fictional and fantastical. For this particular venture, I decided to fabricate a realm based upon the famous nonsense poem Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Though it is relatively brief, this work contains all sorts of delightful made-up words referring to unknown creatures and locales. Now, in fairness to any experts out there, I am aware that there are some limited accounts of the meanings the author actually intended. However, I decided not to follow that particular path. Instead, I more or less went with whatever came to mind as I read the poem. I can only hope that my own errant extrapolation is at least an entertaining one. If any of you listening would like to see more fictional content like this every now and then, please feel free to leave a comment to that effect. I will see how this little experiment is received, and proceed from there. For now, I hope you enjoy this exercise in speculative biology. A lecture concerning the infamous Jabberwock, the ecology of its habitat, the Tolji Wood, and a few of the other creatures that make their home in such a place. The Jabberwock, or Jabberwocky in some dialects, is a singular sort of monster. What makes it particularly special is the unique environment that it inhabits and more or less dominates. This environment, colloquially known as a Tulgy Wood, is a subtype of liminal forest. For the sake of clarity, a liminal forest in this instance is a common descriptor for a form of forest that exists on a boundary between conventional reality and some sort of alternate dimension, or unreality. Such liminal biomes vary greatly depending upon the nature of the disparate dimensions at their boundaries. This inherent and often nonsensical variation makes such biomes troublesome to properly classify with any great detail. Their semi-real nature makes this all the more difficult, as conventional photographic equipment doesn't tend to work properly in such environments. One must rely upon the photoidetic methodology, wherein a conscious mind is used as a sort of buffer to correct for unpredictable deviations. Alas, in the case of Tulji Woods in particular, the environmental effects on human perception and mental processes lead to an unavoidable degree of distortion. To put it another way, things are not always exactly as they appear within such an environment, and technological constraints extend this issue to all of the currently available photographic processes. A Tulji wood is believed to exist at the intersection of conventional reality and an alternative version sometimes referred to as the Whimsy. Though little is known of the precise nature of the whimsy, it appears to exist as an as yet undefined influence on certain human minds, particularly poets and other artists. While this influence is by no means universal within these groups, it is significant for certain individuals. With the admittedly indirect and often conflicting insights from such minds, we can deduce that the whimsy is one of the so-called idea dimensions. That is, a realm where information has a comparable substance and form to conventional matter. It is believed that past interactions with such dimensions are the source of various mythic traditions of a true name carrying power or especially potent words that can influence the natural world simply by being spoken aloud. Obviously, such a realm is not habitable for human life, but people have been known to venture quite far into Tulji Woods without particularly ill effects. That is, of course, unless they encounter a Jabberwock, or a similarly malevolent inhabitant. It would seem that the whimsy has its dark side, which may be inferred in part from the melancholy and madness so regrettably associated with many of the especially ingenious artists. In any case, this apparent darkness makes the Tulji Wood a potentially dangerous sort of place, despite its otherwise pleasant aesthetic. 
Thus, it is worth taking a bit of time to more thoroughly explain this remarkable biome and some of its more noteworthy inhabitants. To begin with, I should define the typical experience of traversing a Tulji wood. This variety of liminal forest is generally recognizable due to a combination of five basic traits. While these traits are somewhat variable, they are consistent enough to be recognized with relative ease. First, the colors in this biome are a good deal brighter and more vivid than what one tends to find in more normal forests. This may be a manifestation of a sort of warning coloration, as many of the local flora and fauna exhibit a degree of toxicity. Happily, much of this toxicity takes the form of psychotropic effects rather than more lethal or debilitating poisons. Even pollen samples have been shown to have potentially hallucinogenic properties. Thus, it is recommended that one avoids visiting a Tulji wood during the spring or early summer, unless one has prepared suitable protection and countermeasures. The second phenomenon is a remarkable preponderance of bioluminescence in nocturnal and crepuscular hours. Some observers have noted that a Tulji wood often feels brighter at night than it does during the day. However, this is not absolutely universal, and there are patches that are almost entirely lacking in such illumination. It is worth noting that these patches tend to be associated with a particularly heavy forest canopy, rendering them quite dark and foreboding during both the day and the night. Third, daylight appears to be strangely attenuated, with a tendency towards longer wavelengths. Even midday sunlight takes on a quality comparable to that of a warm sunset. The overall effect is quite pleasant, by some accounts at least, and it does not seem to be accompanied by especially cold or unpleasantly warm temperatures. If anything, the borders of Tulji Woods are regarded by many as being quite cozy. This is a danger in itself, as the unwary can easily find themselves wandering into deeper, more dangerous regions. Fourth. The native flora are often oddly contorted and may exhibit worrisome hints of sapience under certain conditions. Though no conclusive proof of autonomous movement has yet been demonstrated, or even clearly observed, there does seem to be a worrisome tendency for trees to shift their locations when nobody is paying attention. This apparent shifting could simply be an illusion, caused by the somewhat unstable reality found in any liminal forest. It might easily be a form of hallucination as well, which would be consistent with the irregularity of available accounts. A Tulji wood will often have fragmented paths and trails that lead to nowhere in particular. Even streams and rivers appear to have little sense to their arrangements. As often as not, they seem to flow uphill, though more careful investigations have thus far revealed this to be an illusion. In the end, these odd phenomena may largely be due to the documented psychotropic effects of the Tulji wood. Fifth, there is an unusual and as yet largely unexplained preponderance of fungal growth. The distribution is uneven, but one doesn't usually need to walk very far to find at least a few modest toadstools. In the more abundant patches, the local fungi are considerably larger and more vibrantly colored than most of their earthly counterparts. Preliminary samples collected from such fungal growths have demonstrated a curious anomaly within the tissue structure. Rather than the usual mycelial hyphae, these fungi appear to contain bundles that are superficially reminiscent of neural tissue. If this resemblance applies to function as well as structure, it might easily suggest a worrisome sort of sapience about the forest. Some visitors have noted a sense that they were being watched, and a few claimed it was the Tulji wood itself that was observing them. As yet, this is merely speculation, though it does provide additional cause for caution in any would-be visitor to such a locale. More permanent human residents seem unbothered by such impressions, though this may simply be a matter of acclimatization. That, and most of the sorts of individuals that would choose to live in a Tulji wood, tend to be a bit esoteric. Most dwellings are simple cottages. There are larger structures in a few locations, but these are almost universally uninhabited ruins. Well, uninhabited by humans, at least. These ancient remnants tend to be favored by many of the more monstrous predatory species. 
Of course, the greatest and most demonstrable danger within Atulji Wood comes from the resident Jabberwock population. However, there are a number of other unusual creatures that are also common residents within this rather idiosyncratic ecosystem. A brief look at some of these organisms will provide a greater context to the notorious predator that dominates their home. So, let us consider a few of the other local forms of life before looking at the Jabberwock itself. One of the most useful species within a Tulji wood is known as the Tum Tum tree. When mature, these trees are often considerably larger than the other local species. They are recognizable by their expanded trunk, and some people have theorized that they are distant cousins to the baobab trees of Earth. The utility of this particular tree is twofold. First, it is uniquely non-toxic to terrestrial forms of life. Some travelers insist that its leaves make a passable tea that can neutralize some of the poisons found in the Tulji wood, but I have not seen conclusive proof of this. That said, the tea is rather nice, having a taste somewhat reminiscent of ginger and cinnamon with a light citrus overtone. The second benefit of the Tum Tum tree is derived from its unusually spongy bark. This material acts as a natural shock absorber and appears to have the curious effect of dampening local sound. As words and other sounds carry a particular weight in a Tulji wood, Many of the local animal species employ various coals as offensive or defensive weapons. Proximity to a tum-tum tree tends to mitigate the effects of such sonic attacks. As such, it is highly favored as a campsite, or even a simple resting place. Some of the most carefree inhabitants of this forest are the toves, and the slithy toves in particular. A tove is a creature that appears to blend the attributes of a fuzzy caterpillar and a particularly agile sort of ferret. The toves live off of fungal growth, and they are immune to most, if not all, local poisons. They even go so far as to incorporate the poisons into their own bodies. Among many species, the males have a vivid azure coloration that may serve as a warning of this toxicity. The slithy toves have developed these borrowed toxins into rather potent stings, most often borne on horn-like projections near the head. In fact, these odd structures appear to be more analogous to insect antennae having a degree of sometimes unsettling mobility. Regardless of these venomous armaments, the slithy toves are not especially aggressive. Indeed, they tend to be quite gregarious and sociable, with different species often found working together. It has been theorized that the collective fungal cultivation of the toves might be the cause of the unusual preponderance and splendor of mushroom growths in Tulji woods. Despite the potential risk of unpleasant envenomations, many visitors actually seek out the slithy toves during a specific time of year. This season has no precise equivalent on Earth, though some contend that it is reminiscent of early autumn. Locals most often refer to this time as Brillig. As this Brillig season approaches, the slithy toves gather in special clearings within the Tulji wood. They burrow in a rather characteristic fashion, cultivating an abundant growth of especially large and luminous mushrooms. This verdant fungal patch is commonly referred to as a wabe. One day in early Brillig, the males harvest some of the smallest of the mushrooms in the wabe and crush them into a sort of thick paste. They then begin to apply this paste to their fur in various patterns, often accentuating their natural azure patterning. As evening falls, the slithy toves gather within the midst of this fungal cluster. The male pelts begin to luminesce with patches of eerie light due to the fungal extracts they applied earlier in the day. Then, the males climb atop the mushroom caps to begin a very odd sort of courtship dance, trying to win the attention of the females. This dance consists of two basic motions, known as gyres and gimbals. The gyre is a sort of corkscrew rotation of the slender, flexible body. The gimbal is a rapid, sinuous leap that is vaguely reminiscent of an inchworm's motions, albeit much faster and far more acrobatic. A gimbling male seems to flow through the air as he moves fluidly from cap to cap. The whole spectacle is rather odd, and it is said to be quite impressive. So impressive, in fact, that a number of people have tried to obtain photographs. 
Alas, something about the conditions found in an active wave causes even the most careful photoeidetic images to come out blurred and badly distorted. So would-be observers must resort to seeing this particular event firsthand, risking a journey into a Tulji wood sometime in early Brillig. In contrast to the Toves, we find a rather different sort of resident often hiding among the contorted vegetation. In terms of appearance, a Borogov bears a superficial resemblance to a toad. However, the tentacles tend to leave scientists a bit baffled as to their actual phylogeny. Most researchers believe these creatures to be amphibians of some sort, though this view is contested by several authorities. Perhaps not surprisingly, the major opposing theory suggests an affinity with the mollusks, and the cephalopoda in particular. A typical borogove is roughly the size of a house cat, and it is not an especially active creature. It tends to wait for smaller creatures to draw too close before grasping them with its tentacles. A borogove will frequently settle in among a patch of flowers to help it draw in suitable prey. To further aid in this endeavor, these ambush predators are capable of altering the color and texture of their skin at will in a superlative display of camouflage. However, they will often cast such concealment aside, appearing in bright and almost painfully vivid hues. It is believed that this allows them to silently communicate with nearby members of the species and possibly other creatures as well. There is one pattern in particular that is especially noted by the other residents of the Tulji Wood, human or otherwise. Even experienced human travelers pay close attention to this display. The Borogov skin becomes distinctly muted before taking on a deathly pallor. Sometimes the creature returns to more normal coloration a minute or two later and all is well. On other occasions, waves of iridescent color begin to travel slowly across the pallid Borogov for a short while before the creature hunkers down and fades into the background as best it can. This particular display generally warns of the approach of a large predator. It is believed that the Borogov tentacles have a highly developed tremor sense, allowing them to detect the footsteps at a considerable distance. Whatever their detection mechanism might be, the warning display is carefully noted by local observers. Most of the human residents refer to a Borogov in this state as going all mimsy. Another sort of warning display is found in a relatively small variety of animal known as a momrath. These creatures often appear in various tales told by Tulji Wood residents, generally with an air of mystery oddly blended with comedy. Some stories have a swarm of momraths filling a similar role to the so-called Greek chorus, often seen in the various plays of ancient Greece. Stories aside, these creatures do have a certain mystique about them, largely due to their singularly evasive nature. They tend to travel in groups, moving with surprising alacrity. They are so skittish that nobody has managed to successfully capture a live specimen. Attempts thus far have yielded nothing but a few stray hairs. Unfortunately, trapping has not been successful either. It would appear that a momrath is highly flexible beneath all of its fur and able to wriggle free from almost any confinement. The hairs can also break away quite readily, allowing a rapid escape from most predicaments. More tightly sealed containers have yielded only a few scraps of hair and spindly fragments of an odd chitinous material. The speculation at this time is that the little creatures die and rapidly degrade into mummified fragments when confined in this manner. However, as with most aspects of a momrath, this is by no means a certainty. Because of these peculiarities, there is remarkably little known about the anatomy or physiology of these timid creatures. Visually speaking, the only real description of a momrath is how remarkably fuzzy it is and the distinctive pair of unusually large, dark eyes. These eyes doubtlessly bestow a sharp sense for potential dangers, especially as the momraths almost always travel in groups. While all of these adaptations improve their chances of survival considerably, there is one defensive behavior that they are especially well known for. When these nervous little creatures detect the approach of a particularly dangerous predator, they will collectively begin to emit an unusually sharp, keening sort of sound. A single momrath appears to have very little effect, but the collective sound from a swarm can be quite effective. 
locals refer to the Erie Chorus as an outgrabe. With sufficient numbers, this outgrabe tends to cause confusion, disorientation, and vivid hallucinations in humans, and presumably other forms of animal life, provided they are close enough to its source. At a safer distance, it is still wise to move the other way, as the sound effectively heralds the approach of a large and dangerous predator. Thus, it is common procedure to find somewhere else to be in a hurry whenever an outgrabe is heard. The principal predator of the Momraths is the Jubjub bird. This curious creature seems to blend aspects of a vulture and a pterosaur, along with a rather unpleasant temperament. On their own, they are too small to be especially dangerous to humans. However, they are roughly the same size as a goose and have a similarly cantankerous attitude. This, combined with their jagged beaks and hooked claws, makes it wise to be wary of them. It is unknown how these aerial predators overcome the defensive outgrabe of a Momrath swarm. Most have theorized it is something akin to the tolerance many predators develop for specific poisons when they evolve to hunt toxic prey. Some researchers have theorized the creature might project a mental field of some sort, as its stare is often quite unsettling and is said to have a mild paralytic effect. A couple of the more unconventional investigators have suggested a relationship to the cockatrice, a notorious monster found in a few other liminal biomes. Still, this speculation is as yet entirely unfounded. Regardless of its potential relations, among the human residents of Tulji Woods, the Jubjub bird has a distinctly unpleasant reputation. It is almost universally regarded as an ill omen, and people will go to considerable lengths to keep such creatures away from their homes. This is probably a good idea overall, as these little predators do have a very real and unexpected aspect of danger about them. This danger lies not in the bird itself, but rather in what tends to follow in its wake. It appears that the Jubjub birds often have a sort of partnership with the Jabberwock, helping it to locate potential prey. They call the much larger predator in with deep, booming calls that sound vaguely like Jubjub, giving them their distinctive name. If the Jabberwock makes a successful kill, several of these birds may descend to pick at the remains without provoking any significant reaction from the principal diner. Another creature often found close to a Jabberwock is the Bandersnatch. This creature seems to blend the features of a hyena and a bear, roughly speaking. Like the hyena, it is often a scavenger, and like the Jubjub bird, it is known to pick over the remains of a Jabberwock's kills. A juvenile Bandersnatch might easily be mistaken for a somewhat misshapen animal carnivore. As they approach adulthood, they take on a more distinctive and disturbing aspect. Mature bandersnatches are known to cultivate a thoroughly noxious fungal symbiont in their skin. This tends to make their hair fall out, with the exception of whiskers and a few scattered clumps here and there, but the benefit appears to be quite significant. It would seem that the slightly disfiguring fungus aids them in digesting flesh and bone. They rub their hides over animal remains before consuming them, and a few particularly intrepid observers have noted that both flesh and bone were beginning to liquefy before they were eaten. It is theorized that this fungus also makes the adult bandersnatch far more trouble than it is worth for even a jabberwock to try to consume. This remarkably caustic fungus gives them a serious degree of toxicity, along with a distinctive and highly unpleasant odor. Thankfully, such a scent makes it relatively easy to detect them, and hopefully avoid them. The fungus itself is sometimes known as frumerot, and a bandersnatch with such an infection is generally referred to as a frumious bandersnatch. Certainly a creature to be shunned at all cost. At last, we come to the Jabberwock itself. A creature this famous hardly needs an introduction, but oddly enough, despite such fame, there has been an unusual difficulty in its clear characterization. Very few people have seen a Jabberwock firsthand and lived to tell the tale. Nearly all of our information has come from a handful of survivors' accounts and a few images obtained by remote scrying methods. Even these images are few and far between, as such methods tend to make the subject aware of the scryer. This is obviously quite hazardous when looking in on something like a jabberwock. 
The prevailing belief among the residents of various Tulji woods is that the Jabberwock is essentially a living nightmare with no truly fixed shape. It is said to be a distillation of all of the predatory horrors that lurk in the human subconscious. I suspect the truth is a bit more complex, as humans are not the defining force within a Tulji Woods ecology. There is also considerable evidence that the apparent mutability of the Jabberwock is connected to its hunting method. For now, let us focus upon the commonalities of the various images in first-hand accounts. The descriptions vary to a surprising degree, but there is a general agreement that the creature is large, aggressive, and quite grotesque in its appearance. It is known to have armored skin, requiring a blade imbued with a vorpal quality to overcome. Note that vorpal weapons are restricted to certain liminal realms by the local physics, as their resonant properties rapidly dissipate upon entry into conventional reality. Another Jabberwock feature commonly remarked upon is a luminous quality in the creature's eyes. This would suggest something like the tapetum seen in many nocturnal predators on Earth. However, there is the alternative theory that the eyes themselves have some sort of bioluminescent quality. This would impair the creature's vision considerably unless the bioluminescence was actually generated in the skin around the eyes. The fiery eyes of this infamous predator might in fact be false eye spots. If the Jabberwock is blind, this might not be as much of a problem as one would expect. It has a certain audial qualities that I will describe shortly that could easily form the basis of a sort of echolocation. This would make the creature entirely at home in the dark, and there is considerable evidence that it makes its home in the darkest patches of Tulji Woods. In any case, despite the variations among the details in accounts, the feeling of a Jabberwock is remarkably consistent. Most accounts describe a sort of benighted effect surrounding the creature, as though its mere presence deepens existing shadows and conjures up additional darkness. Human residents of Tulji Woods have a specific word for this curious effect, designating it as the Manxum. For those who would rather not refer to the Jabberwock by name, they might often describe it as the Manxum Foe. Many liken the monstrous creature's general impression to that of a dragon of some sort or another, though they aver that it is something quite different when pressed for details. As mentioned before, the reason for the various observational incongruities may have something to do with the creature's hunting strategy. It appears that the Jabberwock is a predator that relies upon speed and sudden attack, as well as a few fairly anomalous behaviors. Most of these anomalies are based upon the generation of unique sounds, and might easily be the source of the creature's characteristic dark miasma. To begin with, the Jabberwock has a hunting gait that is something like a low, stalking sort of run, which is accompanied by a hollow, deep whistling noise. Some theorize that the Jabberwock's armored hide contains various convolutions that channel air in a worrisome way when it moves at speed. This sound apparently echoes rather oddly through typical Tulji wood vegetation, making it seem as though the Jabberwock is approaching from multiple directions at once. This unsettling phenomenon is sometimes referred to as whiffling. As if this wasn't bad enough, there is another more direct sort of sonic attack, reminiscent of the outgrabe seen in Momrath swarms. This attack is a good deal deeper in pitch, and has a sickening, squelchy sort of quality. It is most often referred to as burbling, and it apparently induces a sense of paralytic terror in those unfortunate enough to hear it. This tends to make most creatures relatively easy prey for the Jabberwock. Unfortunately, it also tends to distort human perceptive abilities, giving the creature a shifting and uncertain appearance. Words and sounds carry extra weight in a place like the Tulji Wood, and this burbling is apparently a heavier sound than most. Some scientists insist that this monstrous thing has an important role within the Tulji Wood, functioning as a keystone species of sorts. This may well be true, but I would not wish to encounter such a creature regardless of its ecological importance. Most survivors note that they were close to a tum-tum tree when the Jabberwock attacked, and were able to climb out of reach. The sound-dampening qualities of the bark diminished the burbling enough to allow them to retain some of their faculties. One survivor took the rather drastic measure of rushing into the middle of a wabe during a slithy tove dance, 
He ended up with a few stings for his trouble, but mostly the little creatures just danced around him as though he were merely some novel landmark in the midst of their courtship arena. There is, of course, the one account, more legend than proper history. Rendered in a poetic style, it describes the encounter of a young man with a jabberwock. He was most likely one of the more permanent residents of Atulji Wood with a decent set of survival skills. He was in proximity to a tum-tum tree at the time of the encounter, and as such had clarity and strength enough to actually mount a counterattack. Apparently, his thoughts were fairly oafish, which would suggest a strong will on his part. That, or else a sort of mental density that allowed him to simply ignore the more debilitating effects of the creature. The vorpal sword he had in hand was no doubt instrumental as well. Most likely, he also had fair warning of the creature's approach, as both local Borogov and Momrath populations were giving off their characteristic warning signals. This rather famous poetic account was recorded by one Lewis Carroll, widely believed to have been a frequent visitor to liminal forests, if not an actual resident. It is most commonly known by the simple title of Jabberwocky. For the sake of academic thoroughness, I will attempt to recite this particular piece before concluding this lecture. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe, all mimsy were the borogoves, and the momraths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the mangsome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, kaloo kalay, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the momraths outgrabe. As we bring this little lecture to a close, I would like to emphasize that, despite its oft-beguiling aesthetic, a Tulji wood is no place for the unwary. If any of you intend to attempt a visit to such a locale, I would highly recommend enlisting the services of one of the more trustworthy locals as a guide. At the very least, be sure to study the potential dangers before travel. Whether you venture so far or not, I thank you for listening, and I hope your day will be a properly frabjous one. Until next time.